What I want you to do right now is write down the name of at least one of those people. Yep. Write, write down that name, please. Type it into your phone. Email it to yourself. And I want you to commit that within 24 hours, you're going to call that person. You're not going to text them. You're not going to email them. You're not going to message them on Signal or Facebook. You're going to actually call that person, whether they're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or upstate New York, or whether they're in Memphis, Tennessee, or whether they're in a rural community in Idaho. And you're going to ask them what this election has meant to them. You're going to ask them what their concerns are about the world that we're about to embark upon uh, January 20th. And you're going to listen. And then you're going to ask how you can help. One of the major things I've experienced is I've made my way around the country, particularly in places like Texas and North Carolina uh, and New Mexico, is there's a lot of the country that feels like the people in this room don't give two shits about them, that we don't understand or listen to them. And you cannot fight your enemy unless you understand them. And you'll often find that sometimes among your enemies are allies. So you can begin the process within 24 hours, if you haven't already, of getting to know your enemy slash ally, and maybe also finding a concrete way that you can be of help elsewhere in the country besides the cushiony New York City that we live in, where 90% of the people on this island didn't vote for Trump. Because there are people you know in places for whom it was the other way around, and we need to be in touch and working with those people too. That's it. ourselves and we can talk with you and um, listen to the listen to these calls for action listen to a lot of the analysis that we've heard tonight um, you know it reminded me of something I've been thinking about which is this whole question of fake news and how to know what to trust and how to know what we're reading and even to the point where people on Facebook are correcting each other like take that down that's not real what's your source and then at the same time you know have putting things up that are real and having them ignored because people may not believe them. And I started thinking, I wish we could have, you know, some kind of watermark. I wish we could have something like, uh, you know, in the 1950s, the Ladies Home Journal used to give a seal of approval to products that you could trust, you know, or the Underwriters Laboratory would put UL on an electrical appliance and then you knew it wouldn't explode when you plugged it in, or, or some kind of symbol for halal or for kosher. So I need some kind of symbol like that, um, going online or looking on screens to know this is tr uh, trustworthy. Like, where's, where's, where's my, uh, my group, where's my meeting, you know, for that? That's, that's what I would go for. But we've heard a lot about contradiction. We've heard about amnesia. We've heard about trauma and memory. Um, about questions of address, who is included in questions, who is not, who is being addressed, who is being spoken on behalf of or for, um, who is here, who's out there, who are we, who are they. Um, and what happens under these different regimes, the kinds of stories that um, Walter brought, that Natalia and Susanna brought, that Angela brought, um, the kind of examples that Michael was giving. Um, I want to hear what you have to ask. I want to hear what panelists have to say to each other. We have a little bit of time left. Um, I think it's been incredibly inspiring. I want to keep that going. Yeah. And uh, let the mic come to you and identify yourself so we know who's talking. Yeah. Okay, my name is Lynn miller Lachman, and I blog about a lot of these issues. I also spend part of my year in Portugal, and I have been to the Museum of, um, of Resistance, and definitely recommend anybody who goes to Lisbon um, go to the Resi Museum of Resistance and Liberation. Uh, but one of the interesting things about that museum, and my own um, research into the history of Portugal, is the way that um, the movement was so clandestine and how people really had to hide. Um, and there were very small cells of people who were able to act because, you know, if one of the cells was 
arrested, um, that it wouldn't be everybody who was in resistance in that neighborhood or in that city who um, would be arrested. And Walter, um, I really appreciated your presentation to Walter Bernstein about um, the whole issue of the blacklist and you could get off the blacklist by giving names. Well, now we get to this organization, Bo Willman, that you started, and nowadays we don't need to have to hide or we don't know how to hide, and the authorities don't need a blacklist or torture because you can just go on to Twitter or Facebook. How do you deal with that if we're going to be resisting a police debt? Well, I think there's a question for anybody up here. Yeah, please. Well, but there's, there, there may not, who knows? Well, Newt Gingrich is calling already for some form of uh, new House and American activities, but Trump has been training uh, various constituencies for some time, and one thing he started to do was with the press, he's denying access. He did it selectively, and then the whole, you know, Authoritarians are very into spatial politics, right? So the way he set up his rallies where the press was put in a pen and they were slowly, you know, it was very interesting because plenty of people in America already hated African Americans, they already hated Hispanics, and, but some of them were taught to hate the mainstream press to a degree they hadn't hated before. So he put them in a pen which criminalized them. So denying access selectively and then to entire media units was the first form of doing this kind of thing. And then we don't know what else will evolve. Uh, as I understand it, you were saying that uh, if somebody signs up for Bo's organization or whatever, uh, they're going to know about it. The authorities are going to know about it. Of course you wouldn't. They know about it anyway. You know, there's very little, if anything, of you that's still secret. You know. And uh, at the moment, you, know, you don't have the necessity to hide. Uh, perhaps it may come, and if it does, uh, knowing how to hide or learning how to hide becomes fairly easy. <laughs> we'll find that soon enough. <laughs> and, and don't forget, I mean, I, I, I was, you know, it, it, there's always this drive to claim a kind of heroism in advance of action also. And I would just say that, you know, you, you'll, there's a long ways to go before they're going to be after many of us. And let's let's do something to, to warrant that first, you know. And, mm -hmm. and also... <laughs> It, it, also, you know, I, I did anti-Cuba work in the 1970s. I was threatened with libel suits. I had letters to editors denouncing me as a foreign agent. I had the Center for Constitutional Rights defending me. And when I picked up my phone in Chicago to make a call, I'd hear the two guys talking on the phone who were bugging my lungs. They said, please hang up, I gotta make a call. <laughs> so, you know, it's not like this is this giant monster behind the screen. Yes, you figure out how you're gonna move through that. And you know, and then you figure out what we can do. I'm more concerned with what we can do that's effective right, right. than what's going to stop us. Right. I'll just put that out there. But maybe, yeah. maybe just one last thing. Yeah. The question. Uh, wait, you need a mic. Where's the mic at that end? Should be on the floor. Oh, um, that has come up that I see the most uh, crucial and important right now is the question of trying to uh, beforehand generate sanctuary spaces and so many people involved in education whether it's a high school and elementary or a college level or community <coughs> colleges because there are there's such an enormous amount of uh, people in this country not only through the DACA program but e even outside of the DACA program that enter into pre-formed citizenship and just belonging through public education and those people are terrified right now. And so, so many campuses, university campuses across the U.S. have started these petitions, sending to their chancellors, their presidents, saying we want to become sanctuary campuses. We need to be, and this is a question of action, we need to be educated 
by lawyers who have been working on this issue, because we're all signing these petitions, but what exactly does that mean? Like, mm -hmm. does, how, is it possible for any of these physical spaces, which are schools, which are universities, to become places where these uh, children, students, and their families, because that's the problem, is that all these schools, even if they resist not giving up their names, all their files contain the information and all these you know, thousands, probably millions of undocumented families that will get deported. Um, I think the sanctuary movement, though, um, as someone who works inside a university, also serves another, it serves another purpose, in a sense. Um, you know, apropos of, of flying something and see who, who, who lines up where, this is the way that you do find out in something fairly innocent, where nothing is at stake really for people personally, whether or not they're going to back this. And you may find out an aspect of of you know where people are going to stand. You can encourage people to take this small step. This is a small step. This is a harmless step to speak up for this and to get together and do this as a community. You know. So. And, and just for a foot. The sanctuary, a foot, yeah. uh, sanctuary campuses and city movements well underway. Uh, you know, student organizations obviously. You know, they they you got that young that young blood uh, jumping into the mix pretty quickly. So you start to see them on campuses. But for instance, I was speaking to a city council member of Santa Fe um, a few days ago. Tomorrow, the city council of Santa Fe will introduce resolutions to make Santa Fe a sanctuary city. Uh, and they're already looking at how they're going to uh, deal with uh, federal funding being taken away from them if Trump follows through on his threat, not that he's in power to, but Congress is, uh, to take away federal funding. They, they, were, they are going to look at the budget and how they will cope with that and telling their citizens, we're still going to provide the services we need to provide you, um, even if we don't get federal dollars. Uh, and I was speaking to an attorney general of a state, which I can't mention here publicly, uh, who said that lawyers are already looking into the loopholes that can prevent the federal government from actually taking away federal funds. But the fact that a city, an actual municipal government, is willing to say we are willing to relinquish federal funds to make this public state statement as a municipality and as your elected officials is exactly the sort of pressure points that we can put on communities around the country where people on a local level could be lobbying their city councils, their county commissions or county boards uh, uh, to, to follow a model resolution to become a sanctuary city. And if you don't do it, then you will get punished at the ballot box. Um, so, so these are the sort of actions that one can take. Also, I just want to add to that, don't underestimate the symbolic significance of these cultural spaces, like the one that we're sitting in now. You know, I'm so grateful to Eugene and Dennis, Brian, and, and Lisa for opening up uh, from Southern Women's Center for us to be meeting here now. And, yeah, you know, I told a few stories from the past, but I didn't mention the footnote. Lincoln Center was bombed for having a Cuban dance company appear here. That happened. We're talking about memory and amnesia. That happened right here in New York. Film Forum had to hire 24-hour security guards when they did a, screen, a, a series of Cuban films. The Cuban right wing was bombing airlines and killing mm -hmm. people and going unpunished. So these cultural spaces also need to be claimed, defended, used, and appreciated as we march forward into this new period with all kinds of organizing. Don't, don't forget about them too. Yeah, we've got some questions out here. Uh, um. My name is Jim Forat, and uh, I just want to remind people, too, that the mayor of New York City marched into one of the larger spaces here at Lincoln Center and pulled out the Palestinian leader who was sitting watching a concert, took him out. And that caused a lot of pushback. I, just, I work with a group called Gays Against Guns that came out after the Pulse shooting. It's, an inclusive, it's not an exclusively gay organization. It's inclusive of multi-issues. And we have talked a lot about what do we do now. And one of the things that we, we felt is within our own group by talking about how we were feeling is that people were afraid. The, the, the kind of manipulation of fear that the campaign 
and the media has created, how do you deal with fear? So one of the, our actions has been, one of our affinity groups, is that we're going around town singing Christmas carols that we have rewritten with the very radical messages within them to give people and asking people to come and join us and sing along with us so that we're working against this normalization, number one, and number two, we're doing it openly as people from an organization called GAG or G Gays Against Guns to say that identity politics does not, there's a real attack on identity politics now and some of it for very legitimate reasons. But the reality is when you know who you are, which was what the basics of identity politics from my generation was about, you can then look and sit in a room, be in the same boat with lots of other people who are looking at who they are, and we have to find out what we have in common. Everyone doesn't have to do the same action. That's what's really good about this action network idea. Figure out what you want to do and find those friends or new friends that want to do the same thing. It's, there's many fingers on, a, on, the, on the fist or the hand of resistance, and just do that. And be not afraid, we live in this intensely surveilled society. One of the things that we're doing is not being afraid to show our faces, knowing full well how that can be dangerous. But just fuck it. You know, we cannot all live underground. And those people that want to live underground and those people that want to organize that way, I say, good speed. But we want to be very public in this resistance, and we want to be very diverse in who we are. And we don't all have to work together. We don't have to all love each other. But, but what we're looking at, I'm a white gay man. I'm trying to look at how do I not dominate this meeting? How do I not, you know, because of the privilege and the skills that I might have verbally, how do I not do that in the larger world outside? And, and this goes way back to the early days of, of organizing the gay liberation fronts and the, women, the tools that women brought in from women's liberation. Everyone has a voice. Help them find it. for Natalia. Um, you expressed some ambivalence about the, um, the efficacy of political cinema today. I was wondering what your opinions on, on the weakness of kind of revolutionary aesthetics of European or American avant-garde is today. And then you also mentioned a few films by like Peter Costa, and I was wondering if you think that the future of political cinema is post-colonial, not the European avant-garde as it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, I think that the the failure of political, I mean, the, its gains, but also its long-term failure, is comes hand in hand with the failure of socialist revolutions of the 1960s or starting from the 1950s on, right? Meaning we live in this post-1989 world where you know neoliberalism as the most recent form of capitalism has just become the norm everywhere in the world, right? Um, so, so that the failure of political cinema and you know its iteration in the 60s and 70s, I think, is related to that other failure because that was what it was. Is coming with, you know, it was at the service of those social movements and those political revolutions. Um, and I think we're in a very different moment today, so that I think that also the very avant garde aesthetic that was played out in most of the political cinema of the 1960s and 70s, and which, I mean, it's interesting, I, I don't think, when I think of that cinema, I think that it was a cinema coming out of Latin America, out of Africa, and out of Asia, but not necessarily. Um, out of the U.S. and not Europe, right? Um, um, and I, yes, I mentioned Costa and, and I mentioned work of Susana's um, or work in, like Passing um And I do, I do think that it's it's kind of the the, the multiple uh, uh, practices. 
practices and aesthetics of the post-colonial, you know, and post-colonial and sometimes ex-third world, we don't call it that anymore, right? Um, uh, but I still use that term because I think it refers uh, easily to the vast majority of the world today. Um, still, so, and I think, <laughs> yeah, and I think a few words, and I think that that is where that sin was coming from, and that is a lot of collective work being done. Um, yeah, but I think it's it's different it, it, in in as much as it's collective work or it's historical work in the way the kind of historical work that someone like Susana does or Basentino in Paraguay, um, working through archives that have been repressed and that have much to teach us in how we engage and we activate, we don't only contemplate, but we activate those archives, which is what, you know, the work of someone like Susana is doing. Um, that is where we will learn our lessons. But those are, they're not gonna necessarily be high modernist lessons. They're, they're the lesson of high modernism in film but that has passed through television, that has passed through, you know, the emergence of digital culture. I wish sometimes that there were things like Netflix series being done in the third world. But we, there, is, there, there is no resource to do that kind of work, right? Because I, I, I'm saying that I wish because I, it would be interesting to see what a, that kind of storytelling, right, a, in the way that it has taken off uh, a, a political message here in the US, that kind of new serial a, you know, a television, uh, but that, that th there is no material structure for that in, in, in Latin America or in the post colonial world. So I do think that it's out of these more film collective practices where they, they decide on their aesthetic, and that's why I think there's multiple forms of it, right? But it is the return of history, whether it's post colonial or. Um, yeah, to just go ahead and add to that, I mean, I would, this question of the, the failure of a political cinema here in the context of, say, the history of American film, um, I think you really might want to think about revisiting the LA Rebellion, yes. uh, because what you're talking about in terms of a failure of political cinema, to me in some ways is more through a more prescriptive lens of an immediacy of, okay, I've done this film and then it's going to affect some kind of causality of immediate change. I don't think that you can apply that to something like the LA Rebellion, which to me is the most exquisite measure of a kind of black and perfect cinema, which is also a kind of exquisite measure of thinking of, you know, Bob Stan talks about this, of this idea of third and the first, of third cinema being animated in a first world context. Mm -hmm. So, I would really, you know, if you're not familiar with The Other Rebellion, I strongly encourage you to think about Is that in book? terms. There's a new book. I would revisit the UCLA Archive Project. I would actually even look at the program that was here at Lincoln Center on Tell It Like It Is, of looking at black independent cinema in New York City. I think you might want to kind of broaden your measure of what might constitute a political cinema. Is because there's, I think it's still alive and well, particularly in the context of thinking about the idea of black film. Okay, so I, um, I'm Olivia Harris, or Olivia Gray, um, and I'm 23, recently graduated college in college. And um, I've noticed a really interesting thing going on with my peers, people my age, people I went to school with, people who are didn't go to college and don't, I studied international affairs, so I kind of have a very particular view of the world. And so when I see them and, and I go to the protests, especially minorities, whether you're black, Spanish, or you know, Chinese, you know, any type of Asian, there's so much anger and so much hatred. Um, I just recently went to a, um, protest um, against the shooting, it was another young black kid got shot, and it was, I think it was like the latest protest where hundreds and like thousands of people went to the streets, and it was 
the most beautiful thing because every time I turned around, it was somebody of a different color and somebody who was just so passionate about, you know, what was going on. And then I stepped back and it was, we were in Times Square and these two people were arguing against a cop saying, oh, we're going to shoot you. We're going to do this to you. And there's, there's such an interesting juxtaposition when you take Individualities based on you know different cultures, but also based on different professions, and then it, based on different uh, ethnicities, and, and you try to say, oh, we want to stand up for our own rights, we want to stand up for our own freedoms, and then you have the backlash, which we've seen with supporters of Trump, who say, well, okay, what about us? We want to stand up for our own rights too, and so I think um, with that juxtaposition in you know individualness, individuality. I, I want to think that there's a possibility that there, a, a, a hand can be reached across the table from minorities and people who look like me, people who look nothing like me, and we can say, hey, let's talk about it. But when I talk to my friends and when I talk to other people who don't necessarily have the outlook on the world that I do, they say, no, what are we going to talk to them for? We're tired of being shot and killed in the streets for no reason. We're tired of this, we're tired of that. And I think what a beautiful thing that a film that I've been seeing in art is that just like the humanity, like Moonlight, I haven't seen it yet. But <laughs> I feel like, I know, I need to run. I need to run and go see it. But like the, the beauty of, of showing humanity in somebody who is portrayed in the media as a as a, um, um, like a, what's the word? As, 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 a, as um, an enemy, in a sense, in a way. And to, to show the humanity in that, and I add so much, you know, in what Bo and, and Imani, what you guys were saying about, you know, being able to reach across the table, being able to, to get that perspective, I have so much hope in that, but I, I kind of want to pose the question and, you know, see your opinion on, is there actually any hope in that? And I feel like there, there is, but at the same time, Trump just won. <laughs> yeah, so I, one of the, uh, there's a lot of righteous rage, right? There's a reason to be angry. Um, and one of the things that I, um, my immediate reaction frequently, because there's also a lot of criticism of modes of protest, um, which are often about tone, language and gesture when we're talking about death, right? So that the attention, the, for the attention to focus on um, the performance of rage um, actually pivots our attention in. And my, my child was in eighth grade, had this, and he said, he came back home and he said, all these people in my class say Black Lives Matter is violent. And I said, well, the premise of the organization is the ending of violence, right? That's a very, but, um, and so what you're really talking about, for the most part, is, a, is, is um, an effort to regulate language, an effort to regulate expressions of rage. Um, and the reason that I think that's troubling is that, despite the fact that it's so common, it's so frequent that people say uh, rioting and rage and, and angry protests or destruction of property don't produce anything, history actually shows that's not true. Um, the quote-unquote riots and rebellions produced integration in higher education. It didn't happen after the March of the It happened after people were burning streets, right? Um, the diversification of the media. Black people being on television for the first time. That's a response, right? So um, uh, the shift in the political landscape, all these things. So um, it's hard. To, so I think the question has to be posed is in a different way, which is, does it take this? To have people respond, right? The question should be, why does it take this, right? Why does the reaching of the hand across the aisle not work? Right? That's the question, you know. And I don't, I don't think that I don't. I'm not hopeless, but I think that that's a moral question that has to be posed to this country writ large. And then there was somebody else right here. Two people in the front, and then we have to close. You know what? What I'd like to do is take a number of these questions and then let the panel answer. Okay. So if you can just be to the point, I want to hear if there's a lot of people here waiting to speak. So let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. 
Well, the question I have, which is a concern for those of us who are filmmakers and media makers, is, is um, it's, it's one thing to sort of make work um, in this time. Sometimes the work is small and meant to be immediate, you know, and meant to elicit action. And then there's work that's more of a, like a full-length film that's more reflective, maybe something like Raul Peck's recent film, which I highly recommend. Um, what are the thoughts on terms of distribution? Because, you know, when a lot of these films were made, you know, there weren't many filmmakers. You know, and now we're dealing with a, a very saturated media world. Um, and also a world where so much of the way we distribute things, which has been very effective in Facebook and other platforms, is someone else's platform that we don't have control over and can easily be clamped down. Um, so are there are thoughts from anyone of the panel about the challenges of distribution and, um, and ways of affecting change through our Good. We're going to hold that and keep going. And then you get more Hi, <clears throat> my name is Rafiq Gatwari. I'm an American Muslim, and I'm also the first non-Irish recipient of the Patrick Kavanagh Poetry Award. <laughs> um, I'm gutted that no one talked about Islamophobia. However, uh, my friend Tabishtin is a British Muslim, and however, I'm trying, this is, uh, this is um, appointed to Bo Williams, I just followed you on Twitter, I'm Brown Pundit on Twitter, and I'm trying to work with the Poetry Society of America downtown to organize Muslim poets, American Muslim poets, so that we can take that program forward. And I think hearing you tonight, being inspired by you tonight, I think they're going to need your pep talk down there. So <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. The, the mics are somewhere out there. Just speak if you have them. We're going to keep going so we can address a lot of these before we get out. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm Michelle, but I'm a filmmaker. I, I'm not sure if this is a question, but I mean, I'm South Asian. I literally grew up in New York and New Jersey, and I didn't realize it till later, but we were one of the first families to integrate the suburbs. And like people used to throw bricks at our windows. So I really wasn't surprised when Donald Trump won. It was like, those people didn't go away. Some of their kids I went to school with and were arguing with me on Facebook every time I would put a joke up about him. And we went through this after 9-11, which is going back to your point. You know, I was asked, are you supporting terrorism? for wanting to show like anti-hate crimes videos. We were, Chewie and I were working together at Center for Asian American Media, which is a division of PBS. The wars were starting, like were they gonna lose their funding? You know, we've been through all this before. We formed our own spaces and collectives and election night, I was with some friends who were like, this was exactly like 9-11, we have to, you know, a lot of us have grown out of that. People have had kids now or some people were actually invited to the White House like 15 years later after being secretly underground and like doing organizing work all these years, you know. And I don't know what the answer is to any of this, you know. But yeah, it's very frustrating to keep going through these cycles again and again. Right, let's have one, yeah, these two hands back here. Can you just pass the mic back behind you? If you do that right to there. And uh, let's hear from the two of you, and then we're going to let the panel have some last words. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Shoshana Vogel. I live on Staten Island. Um, spent probably the last 12 years as an activist in, on the West Coast. Came back home, and Staten Island's rough. Um, I appreciate all of you so much for being here and everybody in the audience. What you were saying, I'm feeling you. Because I grew up, it made me the activist that I've always been because I grew up in the midst of severe hate. Severe. I mean, my brother got his head bashed in by the principal of my school in elementary school. The principal did that. But, you know, I felt like, okay, I knew that authority was not for me early. And it was a weird kind of a blessing because I knew what I had to fight always. Just intuitively, I always knew that there was hatred. And so I wasn't surprised either. 
and um, even kind of offended at some people's shock and newfound guttedness because for the last, since 2012, since I came back to New York, I've been so, I mean, really since 2014, but just shut down. So shut down, I've been a fighter my whole life and so shut down because Eric Garner took care of me. He was my neighbor around the corner. And every time I would go to the bus, he looked out for me in ways my dad never did. You know, like, my dad is not black, but you know, like, Eric knew that we, we, we stand for each other. And when they killed him, it just like, I was just done. And I never thought that that would happen to me. So it's okay, I'm coming back, I'm good. That wasn't, there's other personal things in my family that made that happen. But I'm just reminded about the potential for fear. Mm. And so I've always thought of myself as fearless and I know that I am, despite this wake up even for me about that. So I'm just grateful for everyone to be here and for the inspiration that you have. And it feels good to actually put my voice amongst yours. So thank you. Hi, I'm short, so I'm gonna stand up. My name is Angela Levert, and I run the documentary forum at City College of New York. And so what I'm hearing, like what I'm just hearing right now is the fatigue that people of color who are filmmakers, media makers, and also um, attempting to actually do the news are, you know, just like this woman said, done. And now to like be in this kind of climate right now where diversity, like everyone's warning diversity. Oh, we just came to the party, although we've been here for this whole time. So I think that I'm looking at how I can help the people who come to my organization and the people who are looking to get into, um, into creating, um, I kind of think of it as this is an opportunity to document because so much of our histories were not documented previously, but what else can be done? Because in a way, I also think that just anything that is that we create in and of itself is political. So I'm looking at, okay, what, you know, people are coming together, you know, because of the, um, because of what I do, people are looking to me as kind of like, okay, a leadership thing, what, what should we be doing? So I am also interested in hearing from this, especially because we have a history that's already preceded us, and so now what can we do to kind of um, circumvent that? So thank you. Yeah, I think we're gonna just hear from the panel, have some last words before we move out of here. Um, I know everybody wants to say something, so. I, mean, I, I teach documentary at UC Santa Cruz and work with all these kids who want to try to change the world with documentary and try to get people's stories out. And I, my, I agree with the question about distribution. How can we get this work to people? Is film really an empathy machine? Is that true? Or are people just turning the die, you know? And what can we do to, you know, help people open their eyes. I think it's really important. So, um, just quickly, I wanted to pick up on something um, that Imani said and was also echoed. Um, that I think that we're going to see the, the importance of being visible as a form of politics, and that could mean being in the street, being together in the room to, to see other bodies together, this is what Bo was talking about. But also, when you mentioned, Imani, that um, how African-American communities started to record as witnesses what happened, this was kind of for white hegemonic, um, and, and it goes back to imperialist, you know, control of the gays. This was the end of the world. I mean, many, Obama was the end of the world. But this was, this was something that was highly dangerous and needed to be taken care of in a, in a way. And you have this huge backlash arise to many things, but now we have Trump. And this kind of, when I talked about this aesthetic of menace, I really didn't mean it in a high intellectual manner, although I used the word aesthetic. It is, we are having intimidation at a grassroots level all the time. We, we also have it on Twitter. Um, yeah. If you write about Trump, and, and you, you get tons of hate mail. Um, 
hate Twitter, you, people try to shut you down, right? So I think that being visible um, and thinking about what that means and not being living in fear and going out, and, and each person has their way of being visible. Some will, some will do what Bo is doing and be physically together. Some, maybe you could be visible through your pen and writing for certain places. Um, I like to write for CNN because I get, I, I reach America, a certain America.